So today we're going to talk about automated multi-region disaster recovery in Kubernetes for Postgres. Uh, the agenda, super high level, problem space and solution. I'm going to be a troublemaker talking about problem space and uh, Shivani here is going to talk about the solution. So I am Sergey. I'm from Precona. Uh, I'm doing products there. Shivani is a product lead at Allotl and Jan here as well as a software engineer at Allotl. So we're going to talk a lot of fun things today. So problem space. The agenda for problem space is quick recap of why you would want to have disaster recovery. Then uh, quick jump in into Postgres on Kubernetes and we're going to talk about disaster recovery for Postgres on Kubernetes and what problems it brings and then Shivani and uh, Jan are going to talk about the solution. So disaster recovery, well, everyone knows what it is, I hope. So it's a plan, right? How you want to protect your IT systems from data loss in case of databases or from uh, business failures and so on, right? And you want to do it quickly. And there are usually two drivers for disaster recovery. First one is business continuity, which is basically boiling down to SLA requirements. Okay, you need to recover your business within five minutes, within 24 hours or whatever. And the second driver is compliance and standards, which is kind of a uh, dull and sad one because it's usually on the paper. You might not really have a real disaster recovery, but you sign it off, your legal team signs it off, everything is great, but it's not real disaster recovery usually. So, in a nutshell, disaster recovery for databases looks like this. You have site A with a database and you have application and developers. Everything is working. Everyone is happy. Business is happy. Now something goes south. Database fails or the whole site goes down. The developers are unhappy. Application is not working. Business is losing money. What do you do? You have site B which is a disaster recovery site, and you recover your data. Everyone is happy right now. So this is disaster recovery in a few seconds. So a quick recap on Postgres and operators. So again, I hope everyone here is aware how databases and operators work with Kubernetes, but in a nutshell, uh, operators for databases, they provide you a simple way to obfuscate Kubernetes primitives and database configuration overall. So you don't, don't need to be an expert in the way of configuring databases or Kubernetes itself. You just have a dream or you just need a database and you describe this database in a quite long YAML manifest and then the magic is happening on Kubernetes, your database appears, you can connect to it, you can use it. That's how operators work. Right, And the more on it, operators provide you not only with day one where you can deploy databases, but they also give you a way to manage database, day two operations, backup, scaling, whatever you want. So this is the magic of Kubernetes operators. And again, there is an example of how Percona operator looks like. You just specify a number of replicas, you specify the configuration, the version of Postgres, and that's it, you have a working database up and running in seconds. So if we talk about disaster recovery through Percona operators, uh, there are a couple of ways how you can do it. So we have two Kubernetes clusters. They can be different regions in different countries, whatever. And the basic or the simplest way to do disaster recovery is through backups. So you have an operator running on site A in one Kubernetes cluster, and you have an operator running in site B in another Kubernetes cluster. And PG Backrest that we're using now operator uploads your backups to some object storage. It can be GCS, S3, whatever. And then if you have a failure on your site A, you can recover to site B by restoring from backups. Of course, it is suboptimal because, well, it might take some time and, well, if your SLAs allow you, some companies, some customers that we have, they tell, hey, we're okay if our, if our database is down for 24 hours. For some, it works, right? 
So it can be one way, and there is obviously a better way. So you have, again, two Kubernetes clusters, region A, region B, site A, site B, but instead of using backups, what you can do is you can have a streaming replication. That way, all your data is synchronized between two Kubernetes clusters, between two Postgres clusters in different regions, uh, live, right? And besides streaming replication, what you can also do, you can do this replication through an object storage, where your backups are uploaded to the same S3 bucket or GCS or Azure, whatever, and then right ahead logs are streamed directly to BG PG backrest in region B. That way you have a real-time replication to region B. So this is like how you can set up disaster recovery. And that works great, but what are the problems that you're gonna face? So automated failover is problem number one, right? So again, this is our ideal setup. You have database, database is running, developers, applications are happy, and you have disaster recovery in place, replication is there. Now your site or region fails. And what you do is you need to switch the traffic, you need to switch the applications to start using the database in region B. The way you do it right now within our operator is you need to do two steps. First, you need to tell the operator in region B that it is now primary. And it's a simple change, it's just a couple of lines in the manifest. Okay, now it's primary, great, but also you need to switch the traffic for your application to this region. That's another manual step. And these steps, they can be automated, and you can write some scripts, but it's not the job of the operator to do so. It should be some third-party agent. But that's just the beginning of the problem. The next problem would be when your main region goes up. So now you need to think, okay, how do I sync the data back? Because now all your new data is in region B in your disaster recovery. So you need to synchronize the data back and, well, that is the real problem because you have a lot of manual steps now to perform. And uh, there are certain myths about disaster recovery and automation around it. Like myth number one is disaster is a rare thing, clouds never fail, or my data center is super solid, I have backup power, whatever. Well, it's wrong. You can look at how Amazon regions are failing, Asia regions, GCP, whatever, and on-prem data center failed more often than you can imagine, right? And uh, when this happens, again, depending on your um, SLAs, you need to switch as fast as possible. And that's the problem sometimes because we trust humans a lot, right? And uh, when someone is doing something manually, there is a lot of room for mistake. And that is why the automation for disaster recovery is really, really needed. So as I said, I'm gonna introduce the problem and now Shivani is going to talk about the solution. Thank you, Sergey. I actually have my oh. mic. So yeah, so you know, we met Sergey a few months ago at actually KubeCon um, in EU, and he mentioned the problem to us. Uh, we started collaborating with his team to find a solution and build a solution because the company I work at is in the business of building multi-cluster control planes. So we automatically have this sort of uh, view and topology of multiple Kubernetes clusters. So this sort of problem is sort of, uh, you know, in our alley, in some sense. Uh, so the way I'm going to describe the solution we built is first I will go over what a multi-cluster control plane is, what its core capabilities are that can be leveraged for building something like a DR automation solution. Um, then I, we will go through what a DR orchestration workflow looks like and what additional things we had to build over and above our core uh, control plane capabilities in order to automate this whole workflow that Sergey just described. Uh, we, I'll also share a demo which uh, will show all this in action. We've put together the demo uh, with Elotl Nova, which is the product uh, my team works on, and uh, we use Perkuna PostgreSQL operator to do all the deployment and 
and the setup of the two sites. So Jan in my, is my teammate. He did all the engineering work, and I will be talking about it. I'm a product manager. <laughs> all right. So. What is a multi-cluster control plane? It is basically a Kubernetes management cluster, which has other workload clusters attached to it. The control plane itself does not run any workloads. Those all run on the workload clusters. So its main job, the number one thing such a control plane does, is to deploy workloads to one or more clusters. And as a result of this, because it's in the path of all the workloads being deployed, it has this aggregate view of workload topologies, which in turn enables it to orchestrate things about workloads spread across clusters. So this is sort of like the secret power it has, which enables it to do things like this. There are a handful of products in this space. There's Karmada, there's Admiralty, and of course, our Elotal Nova. Uh, there's a couple more, um, Red Hat ACM and uh, CubeFed. I will be using Elotal Nova in the rest of the discussion because obviously that's what we are most familiar with. So the way this sort of control plane um, schedules the workloads is it decouples the placement from the workload definition itself. So you take your application manifest and you deploy it onto the control plane as though it were going to run there. But in reality, it doesn't run on the control plane. What the control plane does, it, it, it has all these scheduled policies which have been defined. And you can have default policies too. You don't have to define a policy per workload. It has these scheduled policies it tries to match the incoming application manifest with a schedule policy, and then accordingly spreads the workload onto one or more clusters. So this is essentially what the basic structure of a uh, schedule policy looks like. It, it has a couple of ways to select the resources and then match them to one or more clusters. So the namespace selector and the resource selector are ways to narrow down the resources, uh, and the cluster selector is to select the target clusters. And if you do not specify a cluster selector, that's fine. Um, NOAA will make a capacity-based decision to place it on any of the work uh, workload clusters that it's managing. Similarly, if you specify more than one, it'll again make a capacity-based decision. So the next thing that you can specify in a schedule policy, and this is actually very, very core to being able to do something like a DR or a HA setup. This is spread specification. Essentially what it says is, take my workload definition and clone it onto all the uh, selected cl workload clusters. And this has two modes. There is a divide mode, which is more like you know, splitting your workload. So say you deploy a replica set, which has 10 replicas, and you, say, uh, you select two clusters, and the percentages you allocated are 50-50. It'll put five on one and five on the other. Then there is also duplicate mode, which does exactly as it sounds like. It takes your definition and puts it on all the cl uh, selected clusters. So basically, we're going to use duplicate mode for our DR setup. So that way, you know, all your configuration, secrets, everything is the same across your sites. It's never going to drift. So that's something which uh, is very helpful in maintaining a uh, DR or HA kind of uh, deployment. Okay, so that was the basics of the control plane itself. Now let's look at what a DR workflow typically looks like. I might have oversimplified it, I'm sure I have, but essentially these are the sort of stages that come to mind when people think of disaster recovery. So obviously it begins with the setup of the database on multiple Kubernetes clusters. We'll assume we are all deploying on Kubernetes, and these clusters need to be in you know, different cloud regions or maybe even better in different clouds or different centers if you're, uh, data centers if you're on-prem. Um, so the challenge, I think I've already alluded to this, so by now it's probably um, sort of obvious, is to get the setup right. If you try to do it manually, it's, it's a pretty error-prone uh, exercise. You may not have the same S3 secret, 
for your replication bucket on both your primary and standby. You may not have the same TLS secrets. Your configs may not be same. So using this sort of control plane for which uh, you know, we have the spread scheduling capability with duplication is, is the answer to this first part. The next is obviously data replication. We're not talking about stateless workloads here. We are talking about a stateful workload like a database. So your data has to be there on the other side a priori. You cannot start accessing data from your uh, primary site, which has gone down because of the disaster. So you need to have some form of data replication. Sergey already described the couple of ways in which you can do this. Uh, you know, depending on your RTO, you can primarily go with the backup restore method. You know, if you want tighter RTO, you can, uh, RPO, sorry, I should say. If you want tighter RPO, you can go with the uh, streaming replication kind of method. But this is basically Postgres native uh, uh, technologies. So, which brings us to failure detection. So let's say, uh, you know, your disaster has happened. How do you detect it? How do you trigger the workflow to do the disaster recovery? So this is very dependent on business requirements and what monitoring tools you use, um, how long you want to tolerate the failure before you actually trigger disaster recovery. So you know we want to be able to do this part in a flexible way. And same thing for failover. You know Every organization has their own runbook for the series of steps they want to follow when a disaster happens. Maybe it's not all automatic. Maybe you want to send an email to someone who has the authority to say, yeah, let's switch to the standby and you want to wait for their response. So, you know, you can build in a whole sort of workflow in order to do this, right? So this needs to be flexible as well. Uh, so we are going to do, uh, basically view these as pluggable components in our architecture. I won't talk about failback because it's very similar to failover. So, you know, we limit it to failover since this is a short talk. Uh, so here is what we've come up with as our DR orchestration architecture, right? So we have the Nova control plane, which is the central uh, scheduler as we have already looked at. So it's gonna take care of spreading the workload in an identical way on both the clusters. Next, we have added a failure webhook, which you integrate with your monitoring tool. So you basically register it as an alert receiver. We've also got a failover controller, which is going to run a job, which you will provide to it as a Docker image. And this job basically is the series of steps that capture or encapsulate your runbook. So you can do whatever you want in that script or job that you register with the failover controller. So it's basically these one, two, three steps, right? Define your schedule policy, register Nova webhook with your monitoring tool, and define this job for your actual failover. All right, so with that, let's look at a demo. Uh, the demo layout is gonna look something like this. I have four Kubernetes clusters. One of them is running the Nova control plane. There are three workload clusters registered with it. These three are all in different AWS regions, which is what you would want in reality. Uh, the two of them, cluster one and cluster two, are running Percona database. The first one in primary mode, the second one in standby mode. They are replicating data via the means of a S3 bucket. And the third cluster is running an HA proxy, which is how the clients are communicating with the database. So the HA proxy either goes to one or two and the client is sort of insulated from this fact and seamlessly can be redirected to the correct cluster. The failover job that I registered with Nova Control Plane is as uh, described by Sergey, the minimal steps needed are to at least switch the workload cluster two from standby mode to primary mode, as well as to reconfigure the HA proxy to go to the second cluster. So now we're gonna see the demo. As I said, this is a recorded demo. So I'll try to keep pace with what's going on. So we're first gonna get the Kubernetes. Um, I apologize for the font. Can anyone at the back see anything at all? You can, perfect. So first we're gonna get the Kubernetes clusters that are registered as workload clusters. So this command is going against the uh, Nova control plane. That's our default kube context. So there are three clusters. 
Uh, now we are going to deploy the Percona operator on cluster one and two. So this is the operator manifest. We've added a label to it, to all our uh, objects, to say P cluster all. This will be used for matching the schedule policy. The schedule policy that will get matched will put it on cluster one and two. So this is where the duplicate mechanism comes in. So this will make sure both of them have the same, same configuration, same everything. Um, all right, so let's look at the schedule policies we have. We have four of them registered. This particular manifest will match the first one, which says P SQL cluster all. Let's deploy the operator. So the operator is getting deployed on the first two clusters. Um, now we are going to go ahead and deploy the S3. So we're just checking whether the operator was deployed on both of them. All these commands that you're seeing are going against the NOVA control plane. Okay, so it says two over one. This is how we show when something is duplicated to multiple clusters. So we're gonna do the same thing with the S3 secret because we wanna make sure that it's always the same on both. This is also gonna use the duplicate spread policy. Let's deploy the S3 secret. Okay, so the secret is created. Now we're gonna go ahead and create an actual database resource, custom resource. This will be picked by the operator which will launch all the uh, database processes and do everything. So this is gonna use the secret for the backup that we just deployed, right? So let's go ahead and create the first database custom resource. So we're applying the manifest. Cluster one, this will put it on cluster, uh, the AWS region one cluster. Let's see if it's coming up. All right, so it's initializing, the operator is doing its thing. Now let's go ahead and create a second database. Okay, so the only difference in this one from the first one that we created is that this has standby enabled to true. That's how uh, the operator determines that this one is the standby. And also notice this is using the same secret resource. So th there's no scope for mismatch. So let's go ahead and deploy the second database. Okay. Let's check what's going on with both of them. So these two are using a different schedule policy because they are targeted only to one cluster each. They are not using the duplicate spread one. Okay, so we've got both the Percona database, uh, Postgres databases coming up. Let's now go ahead and start a client, a PSQL client. This is a simple client, which is gonna insert into some dummy table. And then right after inserting, it's gonna do a count. So when on the output terminal of this uh, client, you'll basically see a row count getting printed, which is getting incremented if the client is working properly. What we're gonna do is simulate a region failure, a disaster, by removing the primary, uh, primary cluster. So we'll uh, kill the Kubernetes cluster there. The client will have a minor glitch, which you will notice shortly. In the meantime, on the right, what you're seeing is the actual recovery job, which is now starting to run. So what the recovery job will do is it'll switch the standby, it'll change the manifest of database two to change the standby flag to false and then apply it. And it'll also do the same with the primary just in case the primary comes back, you don't want it to continue thinking it's the primary. So just for an added safety, we switch that to standby. It also reconfigures the HA proxy. So here's the client failing for a brief moment. If we didn't have DR automated, this client would continue failing and some, until someone came and manually did something, right? But now with this whole thing automated, as you see, this client is back in business already. So it's kind of like, you know, things just self-healed. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's basically what the demo is about. I mean, the rest of it, we're just checking the 
recovery job just to make sure if it's done completing and things like that. Um, all right, so let me switch back from the demo. Um, so just some takeaways. Uh, obviously, to survive widespread outages, you need to make sure your database is deployed in multiple clusters in different regions, uh, naturally. Use of Kubernetes along with operators makes DR setup easier, as well as opens up opportunities for automation. And automation of recovery can be done in a simple low friction way using a multi-cluster cl control plane such as Nova. This is how the future work. We want to make uh, everything doable via manifest. So we want to come up with CRD-based definitions for failure detection and failover. Uh, we want to make the control plane itself deployable in highly available mode so that it's not a single point of failure itself, right? Um, so that's basically it. Here are just some resources for you to learn more if you're interested. Um, you know, the link to the Percona operators is there. You can go uh, uh, do a free trial of Nova. We have the full featured version available for up to six clusters. Um, thank you. Hopefully this was useful and, you know, feel free to provide us feedback. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. We have about a 15-minute break. If anyone has questions for them, um, well, we can take a few questions. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I've got a question. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I, two questions. Primarily. One is uh, RPO in case of, I mean, what's your, how do we address RPO in, in the case of uh, automated failover uh, between two regions? And the other one was, I'm curious to understand why you you are not using applications in the same uh, local Kubernetes cluster. From what I can see, you're actually using HA proxy, and applications might be even in different regions. So, how do you address, for example, latency in that case? So, these are the two questions. Um, I guess, um, and Sergey, feel free to jump in. Uh, for RPO, uh, you know, you, if you want tighter RPO, you probably want to use uh, streaming replication, and maybe you can add steps to your um, uh, failover routine before you actually switch to the standby to make sure that you've caught up to a certain uh, checkpoint or something before you actually switch. You know, that if you're using ba backups, that your backup has caught up, uh, but. You know, you can only recover data until the point of the failure, right? There is, um, if something was still in cache and didn't get written to disk, I guess that's, that's lost. Uh, I don't know if that addresses your question. Yeah, probably with streaming replication, probably synchronous replication to the other region, but in that case, there's latency. Yes. So that's why I think, you know, in any case, this would provide probably the automatic failover expects some data loss, you know. Yeah, yeah. it can happen. Uh, yeah, definitely. So can. sometimes maybe organizations might prefer maybe to delay the failover and do it manually just exactly. to avoid yeah. data, data it can loss. Happen as well. you know? And yeah. if that's an option, basically. Yeah, uh, it, it can be an option. Well, okay. if you need the manual failover, probably you would not use this one, right? Because, okay, I don't, I, I just, gonna fail over manually because I need to sync all the data and make sure that data consistency is there. But that one is useful for some other organizations that can be losing some of it, like a couple of transactions or something. There are also ways how you can address or minimize the lag, obviously, right? And ensure that all the data is written, but that might impact the performance for sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Multi-clusters is, is a thing that I'm stuck on. So I'm interested in this. I'm learning a lot here. Um, could you just, for my education, tell me, is Nova Orchestrator, is that actually a cluster in itself with just a control plane node? Or is it a Docker container? And the Nova agents, are those like stateful sets running in master nodes? Just, just a sound bite on the architecture for how that works. Yeah, I'll, I'll try, but my team might want to jump in too. 
Um, so Nova itself is a you know Kubernetes API server with a bunch of controllers backing That's it. That's a cluster. It is a cluster. Okay. But okay. Yeah. Yeah, you do not need to dedicate a whole cluster to right, it. Right, 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 you right, you could share it with other things. And the Nova agents are um, additional controllers just running on the workload clusters. Are they running on the masters of each of the clusters? Is that how that works? They, they are running on the workload clusters. All right, I'll ask you later. Thank you very much. It was very good. <laughs> Uh, if you can uh, give some insight as to what kind of minimum uh, uh, RPO can be achieved with uh, Nova controller? So the RPO is really dependent on the underlying Postgres replication. Like I mentioned, we, uh, Nova itself is not doing the replication. It will just help you set it up by configuring your S3 bucket, you're making sure both sides have the same TLS or S3 secrets and stuff like that. But the RPO, the recovery point objective itself, will depend on your application. Nova can help with RTO, the recovery time objective, but it cannot help with RPO, so. Yeah, RPO is mostly on database. You can achieve zero seconds, but with certain sacrifices, right? But it depends a lot on your workloads, on how you use the data, how you connect it, and so on. Oh, uh, I wanted to ask you because the script you uh, showed uh, seemed rather manual. I mean, that was a failover, and I guess that you need to do some manual uh, steps if you would like to fail over f back, you know, when you switch from primary to replica and then back, something like this. So maybe I wanted to ask you if there is some additional tooling to automate this process even further that you developed, uh, let's say, to have some kind of experience like we do have on RDS yeah. or something like this. Yeah. So it's we coming. don't need to bother which one of this primary and it just can switch uh, to yeah, the secondary absolutely. and back without any, any hassle. It is coming. Yeah, so what we showed is just sort of like a, a simple workflow of a simplistic scenario and it can always be enhanced with uh, more pieces to the workflow. I, from what I understand, uh, what you're saying is that you want to switch to the standby, but once the primary is back up, you want it to automatically switch back. So yeah, that can always be built. Uh, this can always be enhanced to do that. Not yet. We haven't built the fail back yet. But. Last question for you here. So between the two methods of replication you talked about, the streaming replication and the object store replication, mm -hmm. do you have data um, on how fast it replicates? Let's say the primary is in the east region and the backup is in the west region. How quickly it replicates between the two methods? It, it depends mostly on your networking and the amounts of data, right? But uh, Again, with streaming replication, you can change almost like zero lag, zero second lag, so all the transaction would be synced simultaneously. But that would imply some sacrifices again in performance.